So we're moving right along in the Gospel of Matthew. We can find the parable in chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. It's kind of a two-part parable, so stick with me as we read through it, and I'll ask some key questions about it and try to unpack its meaning. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I've made ready my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves are killed, and everything's ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it, and they went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the thoroughfares and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the streets and they gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, you might think the parable stops there, but it doesn't. It goes on just a few more verses. It says this, But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. Okay, I hope you can see here that um, as with Jesus' other parables, this is one of those stories that is rooted in common life. It's rooted in experiences that even today people would be familiar with, like being invited to a wedding banquet, being invited to a wedding and to the reception. Um, that was a common part of Jewish life in the first century AD. And yet at the same time, there's some aspects of the parable that are strange, that are weird, that are uh, unexpected, and twists, right? So for example, in this case, um, number one, why don't the people accept the invitation to the wedding? I mean, think about it. Even today, if we live in a, a, a republic or a democracy, uh, if you received an invitation, like a wedding invitation, to the British royal family's royal wedding, you might think twice about turning it down. I mean, this is a major event. The news uh, you know, media is going to cover it. It's a huge thing. It's something that would be a big deal. And yet, in this case, although these people are being invited to a royal wedding where you know the food's going to be good and you know the drink's going to be good and you know you're going to have a good time, uh, they just turn it down. To do things like um, go to your farm or your business, right? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, also, too, another twist. Notice some of the reactions to the invitation is that they seize the servants, treat them shamefully, and kill them. Now, that, that's an unexpected response to a wedding invitation, right? If somebody came to your house with a wedding invitation, you would not be inclined to take them aside and beat them, right? Or, or much less to kill them, right? So already, just very, you're only a few verses into the story, you're already realizing very clearly that this is no ordinary king. This is no ordinary wedding feast. And these are no ordinary invitations that are being sent out. Sure enough, the same thing happens with regard to the king's response, right? If you sent a wedding invitation out to your relatives and your neighbors and a bunch of them didn't come, what would be your reaction? Would it be to go and find them and burn down their homes? Probably not. And yet that's how the king reacts here. So the king's angry, he sends an army in and he burns down the city of those to whom he had sent the invitation but who rejected and, re and did not respond, and who killed some of his servants. And then finally, why does the king then turn around and say, go out in the streets and bring everyone in, right? Good, bad, the ugly, whoever. I want them all in my wedding feast. And then, at the very final part of, this, of the parable, when this guy comes in and he's apparently not dressed adequately for the wedding, what's the king's response? Tie him up and throw them out of the wedding hall. And not just throw them out of the wedding hall, but throw them into, quote, the outer darkness where people will weep and gnash their teeth. 
Now, if you're a Jew in the first century and you're hearing Jesus give this parable, you know what the outer darkness means. The outer darkness was a way of referring to Gehenna, of referring to the realm of the damned, of the place of darkness and distress, where those who were wicked and who had rejected God would weep and gnash their teeth in punishment and in eternal separation from God, in the torments of what today we would call hell, right? So the beginning of the parable, the kingdom of heaven, is like X, and the end of the parable, being outside the wedding, is like hell. Both make clear to the audience that this is no ordinary king, it's no ordinary wedding, and it's no ordinary wedding feast. So what's going on here? Well, a couple of points. Number one, obviously the king in the parable represents God. And he's giving a royal wedding feast for his son. So the son here is a symbol for Christ, for Jesus, the Messiah. In the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel 7, and Psalm 89, and other places, the Messiah, the king of Israel, the Davidic king, would be referred to as the son of God. That was a standard title for the king in the Old Testament. So that's the background. However, there's even more going on here uh, when you look at the imagery of a wedding feast. Because here, Jesus is alluding to a Jewish tradition that saw the coming of God's age of salvation in terms of a wedding banquet. Uh, this, this Jewish tradition is called the expectation of the Messianic banquet. That's how scholars refer to it. The Messianic banquet, the banquet of the Messiah, the banquet of the kingdom of God. Uh, and this expectation of a future banquet of the Messiah was actually rooted in the Old Testament itself. It was rooted in the prophecies of, of the Jewish scriptures, and in particular in one prophecy from the book of Isaiah, which just so happens to be the first reading for today. So once again, although we're not done with the parable yet, let's go back to the Old Testament reading and see what that is. In Isaiah chapter 25, we have a prophetic description of what would later be called the Messianic banquet. And this is how Isaiah describes this great feast. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So pause there. What is this banquet that Isaiah is describing? Well, notice several characteristics of it. Number one. It's universal. Isaiah says it will be a feast for all peoples. That's very important. That means that it's not just going to be a banquet for the Jewish people, for the Israelites, but for the Jews and the Gentiles, for Israel and the nations of the world. So it's a universal feast. Second, it's not just a universal feast. It's a sacrificial banquet. That is really important. You can see this when Isaiah says it will be a feast of, quote, fat things, right? What is this reference to fat things? Well, here, Isaiah is alluding to the language of temple sacrifice. If you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, um, one of my favorite verses is there. Everyone knows John 3.16. I'm sorry, I'm laughing already. I can't help it. But this is Leviticus 3.16, which you'll never see on a bumper sticker, but which is a very important verse. Leviticus 3.16 says, the fat belongs to the Lord, right? The fat belongs to the Lord. You can put that on a bumper sticker someday if you'd like to. Uh, what does it mean? Well, basically in context, Leviticus 3.16 means that when they would offer the sacrifices, they didn't keep the fat of the animal, which was very valuable for themselves, but they would offer it to God. It would be burned up in the fire. So when Isaiah talks about a feast of fat things, it's just an allusion to the temple. It's an allusion to the temple sacrifices. So it's a universal banquet. It's a sacrificial feast. Number three, it's a supernatural feast. Because at this banquet, what will be swallowed up? Not just the sacrifices, but death itself. Death will be swallowed up 
forever, which means that the banquet is also salvific. It has saving power. As it says, the Lord will come and will save us, take away our sins. Well, I hope you can see now what the significance of that prophecy, the Messianic banquet, is for Jesus' parable in the Gospel of Matthew. If you go back to the parable in Matthew, you'll understand that the feast that Jesus is speaking about in the parable is nothing less than the Messianic banquet, the banquet of the kingdom of God, the banquet of salvation, the banquet where God will swallow up death forever and ever in the resurrection of the dead. And that's why it's so shocking and so important that when God invites people to come to the Messianic banquet, that when they refuse God, that when they reject the invitation, it is a matter literally of eternal life and death. This is no you know, simple invitation to an ordinary wedding feast. It's an invitation to God's kingdom. It's an invitation to God's banquet. It's an invitation to the banquet of the Messiah. And so when they respond to it, either by rejecting the invitation or in this case, by killing some of the servants who bring the invitations, you know now what's going on. Jesus is once again alluding to the rejection of him and his apostles by the leaders in Jerusalem. If you have any doubts about this, you might remember from last week, we saw the parable of the wicked tenants in Matthew chapter 21, which Jesus delivered to the chief priests and the elders in Jerusalem's temple. Well, this parable of the royal wedding feast picks up immediately after that and says, again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. In other words, he's still addressing the same audience here. He's still addressing the crowd in Jerusalem, the leaders in Jerusalem who have rejected him. So they represent, in that sense, those who rejected the servants of the king who have been invited to the banquet. So in response to that, just as in the early, earlier parable of the wicked tenants, the, the vineyard was taken away from the leaders and given to someone else, so too now the invitation was sent to the leaders of the people, but since they've rejected it, the king, says in the story, will go out and invite everyone, the good and the bad, go into the streets and invite the people in for the royal wedding. Now, no king would ever do this. No king would, well, except maybe uh, St. Louis, king of France, but that's a different issue. He was a, he was a saint. Uh, but no ordinary king is ever going to say, invite everybody, the poor in the streets, I want them to come into my wedding. No, you've got to be, there's going to be a short list, even today, for a royal wedding. Uh, you're going to go to the British royal wedding, you've got to be on the short list. You've got to be among the elite of the world, right? Or at least know the royal family in some way. But this king does something crazy. He says, God in the streets, invite everyone into my wedding feast so that the halls might be filled. Good and bad, everyone can come. All right, so what that obviously represents in a sense is the message of the kingdom beginning in the land of Israel, beginning in Jerusalem. But then once the Jerusalem leaders have rejected it, it's gonna go out to the ends of the earth. And it's gonna include not just Israel, right? But also the Gentiles, not just the good, those who are members of the covenant, but as the peoples of the world as well.